Hari 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 Ram Hari Ram 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 Hari Hari Krishna Hari Hari Sankirtan ki jai gor premanande hari 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 go Hare Krishna Mahamantra ki jai Om Agyan Timirandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guravena Maha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stavditam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swampadanti Kam Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Shri Prabhupada Ki Please excuse me, my voice is just hanging on bare thread here. <laughs> Last night we did a kirtan for about two hours and we kind of blew the roof off a little bit. <laughs> You see any damages in the roof? Just send me the bill. <laughs> so we're kind of still recovering slightly. <laughs> we'll continue. And actually, this is the final presentation. Oh, before I start, again, the, we uh, want to encourage all the devotees here to support the proliferation of this movie, Hare Krishna the mantra, the mission, and the Swami who began it all by uh, buying. And it's not only buying, but you're giving a donation to help support this movie to Mother Vishaka. And she's offering two wonderful books. It's actually a combination of the history of the early days of Krishna consciousness and along with her experiences in that history and along with her good husband, Yadobar Prabhu. So it's a wonderful breed. If you uh, go out on the table there, you'll see the all the, what we say, the, what is it, the eulogies, the glorifications of this book by some of the, all of the, the leaders in our movement. It's an amazing book. It's the kind of book, you, when you pick it up, you become absorbed. How many of you read it? Okay, a couple, only two, just Donna Kelly and Preeti Shravana. Oh, okay, Mataji. So it was my, to speak on a personal level, it was my wonderful experience this winter. I just simply got absorbed in the book <laughs> this past winter. So, uh, and of course, she's offering another along with that her an earlier book called Harmony and this is about the community in Saranagarty in Canada along with her realizations on Bhagavad Gita so um, that combination is for only a donation of $25 which goes to the help promote the movie along with a beautiful t-shirt for $20 and so that's I'm just mentioning the minimum we don't talk. We talk minimum because we don't want to scare anybody. But give as much as you can and give more after that. <laughs> giving as much as you can is not really enough. We want to give as much as we can and more because this is actually one of the topmost forms of preaching right now that's going on in the world is this movie. So the more we can promote that movie in a, what we say in a grand way, the more people will become, uh, uh, understand who this great personality is, Srila Prabhupada is. And that's our goal, is to glorify Prabhupada, to show the world what he had actually accomplished. And honest people, and even those who are even less honest, will appreciate Prabhupada. <laughs> it's not possible you can't appreciate what Srila Prabhupada has done. It's, it's miraculous. <laughs> and this movie brings out that point over and over again, just the glorification of what Prabhupada did to begin this movement. And we can also say as devotees, we understand Prabhupada's mercy is still very much prominent with us. So by his mercy, this movement is still proliferating everywhere, going everywhere around the world. So we want everyone to know about that. And then it will appreciate what Prabhupada has given the world and people will become I was speaking to Mother Vishak and she was saying practically all, every showing was sold out and there were some landmark sold out where places that never sold out before in any of their productions and presentations sold out for the first time. Not only one day, but every day that they, they uh, you know, presented the movie. So people are appreciating it and uh, learning about Srila Prabhupada and what, we, what he gave. So, 
Okay, so um, we have been doing this presentation on the demons of Vrindavan uh, and the Anarthas in Bhakti. And this is the fourth presentation, one, two, three, four, the last one. We've spoken about different demons, but just before I actually summarize what we've done already, along with um, going into a few new points, is there anybody who hasn't got the handouts yet? Here you can give one to uh, Fritu Shravana Prabhu and his good wife, Mother Donna Kelly. Anyone else that didn't get it? These, these are verses from Bhajana Rahasya by Bhakti Vinod Thakur, along with a chart showing the eradication of Anartas and also a visual schematic on how everything looks. Anyone else that didn't get it? A copy of that? Radha Bhakti? Okay, so I'll just, Rupa Goswami has explained in very exact terminology and explained his terminology in an exact way. What is the science of bhakti? How it works, different stages, what are the symptoms of each of the stages and what is the actual goal of bhakti? Unless we know the goal of what we do, we really can't stay enthusiastic in the process. And the goal is, there's only one goal, and that is Prema Pumartha Mahan, to awaken our natural loving propensity for Krishna. That's the only goal. The secondary goals that we achieve are supportive of that goal. You know, whatever uh, realizations we have, whatever what we what we say, understandings, everything that we do is, is coming together to help us come to the stage of uh, pure love for Krishna. And so Rupa Goswami explains that that process contains eight, I'm sorry, nine stages. Adhyastrata, Sarusanga, Bhajana Kriya, Anartha Nivriti, Nishta Ruchi, Ashakti, Bhava, and ultimately Prema. And within these nine stages, there are categories within the stages of different symptoms and what we say, expressions of one's execution of bhakti. So, as I mentioned earlier, bhakti is made up of two, two principles that we should understand. And it's like, we talk about bhakti being the science. And what is that? The science of the soul, the soul's re relationship with God. And what is, when we speak about science, we speak about experimenting with ingredients that make something uh, happen. In other words, it becomes a, a, a concomitant fact. And what is those two aspects? the principles of the execution of bhakti which includes things to do and things to avoid anukulena and pratikul and the other has aspect is the mood what is our mood in execution bhakti so the mood is important because even if you have the don't have the ingredients i mean you have the ingredients and you don't have the mood experiment doesn't come to fruition. Just like if you're in a laboratory, you may have all the ingredients to make an experiment, but if the laboratory conditions are not proper, the experiment doesn't work. So, what that is, so our mood of bhakti, what is our mood of bhakti? And Rupa Goswami explains that. Abhyabhilasina sunya jnana kamananavritam anukulena krishna silanam bhakti uttama. And mood is that one should execute service with free from the desire of personal gain through fruit of activities, free from the desire to become what we say knowledge of speculative philosophical scriptures. It should be for Krishna and it should be there to please Krishna. 
not only to please Krishna, but the attention has to be, the execution has to be for Krishna. <laughs> so this is, makes up these four points, two, two negative and two positive. No personal gain, either mentally or intelligently, or even on a physical platform. Fruit of activities, karma, jnana, and, and a desire to please Krishna with the intention of serving Krishna. <laughs> so, that's pure. That's the execution of bhakti. Anything less is called mixed bhakti, and mixed bhakti doesn't attract Krishna. <laughs> Nix Bhakti helps you to get situated in the activities of Bhakti because when we come in, we're mixed. And there's no question about that. Our mixture is you know, what we have, we carry from la previous lives, our material desires, our material tendencies, our material attachments, all these things, our material activities. So they can become purified. But unless one reaches pure devotional service, then one has to keep coming back life after life until one, it's almost like when you go to school, you have to graduate. <laughs> and so if you don't graduate, you keep coming back until you get it right. <laughs> so, so this world is a testing ground. It's a place where we can purify our hearts and free ourselves from the tendency for material life, which is superfluous and extraneous to the living entity's actual position and relationship to the Supreme Lord. In other words, this this whole place is an illusion. <laughs> so anyway, some people don't like to hear this because they oh, I like my illusion. It's not so bad. Maybe your illusion is not as good as my illusion. <laughs> I have better facility in my illusion than your illusion. So, you know, you know, don't get too, you know, let me say strict Maharaj, get real, you know. It's not, it's an illusion's not so bad. I'll get over it sooner or later, not this life, but anyway. <laughs> so, you know, again, it's, uh, somehow that we, you know, the mind wants to say, uh, yeah, yeah, what you say is okay, but, you know, no. The thing is, everyone has the potential to come to pure devotional service. Everyone. Because everyone, that's everyone's nature. No one is deficient by material situations. Why? Because bhakti is not on the material level. It's on the spiritual level. And therefore, it is free from any material influence when we execute it according to the instructions of the spiritual master. So we were talking about mm, the process of anartha nitavritti. What are those things that block the living entity from making progress to the goal of life? And Bhaktivinoda Kaur explains four categories of four anarthas. We went over this a couple times in the previous lessons, but I'll just mention it at this time. And that is misconceptions or philosophical deficiencies, um, attachment to the results of pious activities, attachment or effect, affected by sinful activities, and operats offenses. And each category has four. So there's 16 anarthas that Bhakti Vinod Thakur has analyzed from Rupa Goswami's explanation of, of, uh, of uh, the, the science of pure bhakti. So with that in mind, then we have to understand what they are and how to overcome them. And, and then Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, these, what we say, anarthas produce lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, and envy, which comes, which results in hunger, thirst, distress, illusion, old age, and death. He calls it the six whips. But then, after kind of discouraging us with all the negativity, <laughs> he gives the formula for success, Harinam Sankirtan. 
He says, Harinam Sankirtan is the fast track. It, it crushes the Anarthas, not only removes them, but destroys them completely. So by absorbing oneself and chanting the holy names of the Lord, both Japa and Kirtan, one can gradually purify themselves and come to the stage of what we say, freedom from all Narta. And the next stage is Nishta. Nishta is that stage where one becomes steady. One is not affected by one's, what we say, anarthas, and becomes steady in execution of devotional. So that's what we're looking for. When we get to the process of becoming steady, not being deterred by the external environment or whatever contamination is still there within our minds and hearts, whatever attachments are there. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, when 75% of the anarthas are removed, one can move to the stage of nishta. And then one can gradually remove the remaining anarthas, and most of those are offenses. Those are the ones that are, that are really carry even to the higher stages of bhakti, all the way up to prema. And then Bhakti Binota, of course, says, only when one sees Krishna face to face can one be absolutely free from any tendency to commit offense. So the offenses are, they carry in high, even high stages of bhakti. And we saw that, how we mentioned many examples of how great souls, even, even, Souls that have personal association with Krishna can fall down. We have the example of Jai and Vijay, and many other, even in this world, who have come to the stage of bhava and, and prema. Look what happened to Bart Maharaj. Bart Maharaj was, <laughs> he was on the platform of bhava, <laughs> on the verge of prema, but he, his sentiment become, may became misdirected and he got attached to a deer. The sentiment wasn't wrong, but the sentiment caused him to give up his pro execution of bhakti. That was the problem. You know, a Prabhupada says, and it's mentioned throughout the Shastras, a devotee is soft-hearted, kind by nature, doesn't like to see any living entity suffer either, either materially or for lack of spirituality. That's the nature of a great soul. They feel, they feel for others. <laughs> they rejoice in others' happiness and feel unhappy in others' misery. And so, it was an animal, but still became attached in such a way that his, uh, his devotional activities stopped and his attention became fully absorbed in this young little baby deer. And he was forced to take another birth, two more births, because of that. So when there's an example of how even one who is on such a high platform can fall down. That wasn't an offense, but that was weakness of heart. Weakness of heart means not able to execute the process of bhakti because of some material sentiment or some material attachment. So, um, but again, Bhakti Vinod Thakur says that by the performance of Harinam Sankirtan, I think last night when we had that kirtan, we were, where's Subal, is he here? He disappeared. Huh? We were all praying, where's our Murdunga player? <laughs> we really needed you last night. I had, we had three Murdungas going. <laughs> And it became pretty crazy. <laughs> I think it was like mad. <laughs> I hope nobody filmed it. <laughs> because, because the GBC will start making new resolutions after seeing this kirtan. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> so when I, this morning when I got up, my first thought was, I'm not this body. Because <laughs> all I could feel was my body. <laughs> it was like full of pain. <laughs> but it was a wonderful kirtan. It was just quite amazing. 
And so the devotees, everybody was enthusiastic. I, 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 there was not one person who wasn't enthusiastically chanting and dancing, the whole temple. There was at least 30 devotees here or more. It was mad. <laughs> So that's, you know, I'm sure we got rid of a few anarthas. And then <laughs> maybe not only a few, maybe many. <laughs> so this is what we want. We want more and more of that uh, absorption in Krishna's holy name. And that destroys these anarthas. So in my previous presentations, we spoke about certain demons which represent certain anarthas, Denukasura, Palambasura, Putana, Kaliya, Trinavarta, Aristasura, Keshi. We also talk about how Krishna purified Mali, Manigriva, Nala, Kuvara, and also the Yagya Brahmanas, which all represent different types of anarthas. So um, I was thinking in this remaining presentation to just to mention a few of the other demons that are mentioned by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. And one is, it's, not a, it's a kind of an interesting demon, but it, it manifests itself in a different way. And that is the forest fire. <laughs> Krishna destroyed this forest fire, which was actually a demon in disguise of a forest fire. And I'll read a little bit about this particular pastime. Um, let me see here. There's two versions of the forest fire, not two versions, but two actually separate incidents where Krishna extinguished the forest fire. The first one is called the first forest fire. And what does it represent as far as an anarthas? And this is a very serious anarthas. The first fire, fire, forest fire represents hatred and arguments between Vaishnavas of different religions and disrespecting each other's deities. It can also represent any kind of, any kind of clash or conflict. Srila Sanatana Goswami makes the point that some people say that the fire was a friend of Kaliya who assumed this form and others say that he was a demon who was a follower of Kamsa. Hmm. There's a short paragraph which kind of like summarizes this pastime and I'll read it if you will bear with me. Since it was almost night and all the inhabitants of Vrindavan, including the cows and calves, were very tired, they decided to take their rest on the riverbank. In the middle of the night, while they were taking rest, there was suddenly a great forest fire, and it quickly appeared that the forest fire would soon devour all the inhabitants of Vrindavan. As soon as they felt the warmth of the fire, they immediately took shelter of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, although he was playing just like their child. They began to say, O oh, dear Krishna, O oh, Supreme Personality of Godhead, O oh, dear Balaram, the reservoir of all strength, please say, try to save us from this all-devouring and devastation fire. We have no shelter but you. This devastating fire will swallow us all. Thus they prayed to Krishna, saying that they could not take any shelter other than his lotus feet. Lord Krishna, being compassionate upon his own townspeople, immediately swallowed up the whole forest fire and saved them. This was not possible for Krishna because he, I'm sorry, this was not impossible for Krishna because he is unlimited. He has an unlimited power to do anything. But he told them to close their eyes. And this is an interesting story. Why did he tell them to close their eyes? Because previously he got chastised by his mother, Yasoda, for eating dirt. And Balaram said, hey, you know, Mata, your son, and he's eating dirt. She got all alarmed. Oh, she grabbed Krishna and put her on her lap and said, open your mouth. 
he didn't want to do that because he knew what she would see was not what she should, should see. But she finally encouraged him, he opened his mouth, and what she saw was not dirt, but she saw the entire cosmic creation, all the planets, all the, all the, everything that's in creation in the mouth of her little son. And then she saw something very wonderful along with that. She saw herself looking into the mouth of Krishna, in Krishna's mouth. So in other words, Krishna revealed that he is the source of everything at all times and all places. And then her natural parental affection, which is the happiness that Krishna perceives in that relationship, became overshadowed with Aishwara, awe and reverence. And in that awe and reverence, Krishna didn't like that. He didn't like that at all. So immediately he bewildered her mind and she forgot what she saw and then she was back to her motherly mood again. And that's what, and that made Krishna happy. So Krishna wanted to avoid having his mother look in his mouth again. This time Balaram would say, hey, he's eating fire now. <laughs> Before he's just eating dirt. <laughs> so he told everyone to close their eyes and they did. And Krishna just and was gone. <laughs> Something like that, anyway. And so what does this represent? As we mentioned, arguments. So sometimes, actually there's a one verse in the... It's actually a purport in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the fourth canto, where Srila Prabhupada mentions... One should not find fault with or criticize another person's form of worship. Even if it is what we say, not pure worship, or for whatever reason, one should not criticize others. Like sometimes the tendency may be to find fault with other traditions and the way they worship or maybe the lack of philosophical knowledge that you know is being presented Prabhupada mentions in that mind in that purport that it causes the mind to become disturbed and when the mind is disturbed one cannot execute bhakti properly mm -hmm. the mind has to be focused and peaceful in order for one to execute bhakti in the right way in an effective way. And also to find fault with others. And Prabhupada would not do that. Sometimes he would take issue with the fact that they don't understand their own principles and they allow for or encourage meat eating. So Prabhupada, when he was always challenging, especially the Christians, he would always say, Thou shall not kill. He wouldn't take issue for what, what they were, what their scriptures or what their previous predecessors would say. He would take issue with how they weren't following what they were presenting. But then for one who may criticize their form of worship or whatever, for whatever reason, you would never find Prabhupada doing that. He would always say, these are other forms of bhakti. These are other forms of bhakti or other levels of bhakti, and we should appreciate bhakti wherever you find bhakti. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. bhakti is the essence, and it's found everywhere. In fact, even it's found in the sentiment of the non-devotees, there's elements of bhakti. Although it's not expressed in that way, it still has a certain sentiment, because the nature of the living entity is that bhakti is there, and it comes out in different ways. It comes out in different ways. It's expressed in different ways. So, and then, disrespecting others' deities. Bhakti Vinod Thakur says that when I go and I see how others worship, I think this is my Lord, but he's worshipped in a different way. That's all. 
he explains that. He says the language may be different, the way of worship may be different, the object of worship may be different than what I, the way I do it, but still, these are external. The point is that it's worship for the Supreme Lord in a particular way. Therefore, I should appreciate that and not find fault. <laughs> so sometimes we, you know, we get a little bit, uh, what is this, uh, condescending. We say, my way or the highway, you know. <laughs> so, so it's not like... So that disturbs the mind. So we could appreciate something for what it is. But Prabhupada would make the difference. He said, you know, there's, a, there's dictionaries. And there's the, the um, Oxford Unabridged Dictionary. And then there's, little, there's smaller versions of dictionary. Both are dictionary, but obviously one contains more. So from a philosophical point of view, you might say there's a difference. The presentation. But still, it's not a reason to find fault or to think oneself as better. Because <laughs> that you know, will cause, I mean, sometimes we get it from the other side. <laughs> I mean, we get challenged, you know, that, you know, you're not following God or you're, you know, you're not following the way we follow. But we don't respond in the same way. We just take issue with the fact that they're not following exactly as they propose or present themselves. So, therefore, we avoid confrontations and arguments like that. And that causes disturbance. And sometimes hatred may also come as a result of that. But, the Acharyas, also Bhakti Vinod Thakur, also say this represents any kind of clash or conflict, even amongst Vaishnavas. So when devotees argue over what we say, just like, well, preaching means to do it this way. No, preaching means to do it this way. This is, so sometimes we take issue on how preaching is being done. But Prabhupada said, if one is presenting Krishna consciousness, then one may present it according to time, place, and circumstance. And therefore, the idea is that people have to become, they have to get the message in one form or another. So, preaching takes different forms according to the audience. Like that. Sometimes the devotees argue over that, and sometimes it becomes heated. <laughs> Or just how to execute bhakti in different ways, just like it. And so sometimes we find debates and argumentations and even what we say, dissensions amongst Vaishnav. So this is like a forest fire. <laughs> this is like a forest fire. Devotees don't get into arguments. We present what Prabhupada has given us. We follow it in the best we can. We avoid argumentations like that. We present as we understand what Prabhupada has given us. And if it causes some, what we say, dissension, we don't get into large arguments, which sometimes causes, when we say, personal offenses like that. Like that. So devotees don't argue. Or, or get into what we say. And we've seen that in the history of our movement. It's going on right now. <laughs> it's going on everywhere, even in many even uh, higher places within our movement. But still, it just, this lack of cooperation, as Prabhupada said, when he was asked, how can we please you once you leave our presence? He said, You'll show your love for me, how much you work together in a cooperative way to push on this Krishna conscious new spirit. So wherever there's cooperation, there's great synergy. And wherever there's great systematic organization, amazing things happen. Amazing things happen. 
And especially if devotees don't get along, or for whatever reason, when new people come, they see that. And they think, oh, I'm not sure if I really want to join this place or become inspired by this, because they like me, but they don't like each other. <laughs> It is a story, not a story, it's an actual historical fact in a movement. It was one man, he was coming to our movement. This was somewhere in Texas, it might have been Dallas or Houston. He was coming regularly for quite a long time, and then the devotees said, well, actually, you know, you've been coming, you're visiting, you're also chanting, reading Prabhupada's books. Why don't you become more serious and, you know, take shelter of spiritual. In other words, they were encouraging him to take the next step. And he responded in a very, what do we say, uh, shocking way. I guess it was shocking for the devotees. He said, I see how you treat your guests and I, I see how you treat each other. I want to remain a guest. <laughs> So, so that's kind of like we have something to work on. So a devotee sees that another person, and this is hard to understand, that another person is more important than myself. <laughs> when you see yourself in others and you try to serve that person as if you would be whatever would you would like to be served or do yourself that's the mood what i like and what is good for me i want to give to others and of course that takes the form of outreach or preaching or just general association so when that's there a great amount of what we say cooperation starts to develop and then it's easy to cooperate it becomes natural to cooperate and of course we have a, a protocol for cooperation and that is that there's echelons of various leaderships so when we work together to follow the leadership as given by Srila Prabhupada even if it's hard it takes a sacrifice still what it does it has a certain element that is beyond the material. And what is that element? Krishna is pleased. Krishna is pleased. And when Krishna is pleased, then his mercy flows into that and makes everything wonderful. He makes it all happen in a wonderful way. So this is the power of cooperation and working together to push on Krishna consciousness and to practice our day-to-day. -day. So we want to avoid what we say gossip, fault finding, even the extreme forms of these is blasphemy, finding fault with devotees for no obvious reasons like that. As we mentioned, there's four ways you can see another person. There's actually five or four, four or five. One is the Daksha way. <laughs> Daksha, he found fault with Shiva. Now, Shiva's faultless, but he's quite unusual. He has, he wears snakes and associates in crematoriums. And he, you know, I mean, he's not the kind of person you would think, well, you know, I like to hang out with him because, you know, um, I mean, ghosts are attracted to him. <laughs> Shiva. But he's, you know, he's Mahadev. <laughs> He's, he's a great personality. He actually is like, there's Devi Dham, there's Devi Dham, Mahesh Dham, and Hari Dham. So in the Brahma Samhita, it says that there's three realms of existence. This world, the spiritual world, and Shiva's abode. Well, Shiva's very elevated. He's very elevated. So Daksha found fault with Shiva. And he really broadcast that fault in a very insidious way. Criticized in an open assembly of great Vaishnavas, which included Lord Brahma was there. And he was very proud of who he was and what his service was. And because of that false pride, or that pride of being, I mean, he was so powerful, Daksha, 
that when he walked into the arena, people stood up automatically without even thinking. It was, it was, most, it was spontaneous. He had such an effulgence, Daksha. This was Daksha. He was the son of Lord Brahma. He was a chief progenitor. And he had, you know, he had, he had 16 wonderful daughters. And one of them was married to Shiva Sati. And he was powerful. And because Shiva was in meditation when he walked in, Shiva didn't stand up. Shiva was absorbed in thinking of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Ram. And he didn't, you know, take notice of Daksha's appearance. He was just absorbed. And Daksha found fault with that and started to criticize. Not only criticize, he started to blaspheme. When one senior devotee in our movement asked, well, what's the difference between criticism and blaspheme? That's a good question. Blaspheme, the criticism means there may be some fault, so you make that, you know, you, you see that fault and you broadcast it. What is blaspheme? Blaspheme is worse. Blaspheme means you look for a fault. And then when you find something which you think is a fault, you broadcast that. Even though that person may have many good qualities, you make that personality, person's personality description based on that fault. That's what Daksha did to Shiva. But it cost him his head afterward. It cost him his, as the story. So that's the, that's the Daksha mentality. At least he exhibited it in this particular situation. To see another person and try to find some fault to make yourself feel good or to put yourself in a better position or for whatever reason, maybe just based on general hatred. Devotees don't do that. The next one down is that we were talking about this. You can see a person or you can be in contact with them and you might see some fault. But at the same time, you also might see some good quality. So Vaishnava pushes aside whatever fault there may appear in that person, in his mind or her mind, and then focuses on their good qualities. So that's where we, that's where, that's how we operate. We sometimes, we can't somehow or other neglect the fact that I see something that is a fault, but don't make it, don't, don't it's not important. It's not, unless it becomes an issue and it's causing problems within the society of devotees, then there's some, some rectification. But on a day-to-day -day level, we might see something, or just in our personal interactions, or for whatever reason. But look for the good qualities. Prabhupada says there's the fly goes for the source, there's the honey bee that goes for the honey. And he said, be a bee. <laughs> And then, higher than that, is a person who sees another person's faults as potential good qualities. <laughs> oh, that's a fault, but actually it's just a good quality that's covered over with this little material energy. It's actually go. So in other words, they don't see, f they see this apparent fault as a good quality. That's somehow just covered. And then highest of that is one who sees no faults at all. <laughs> and that's a Mahabhagavat. Even if there is faults, then there's no vision of faults like that. So that's the highest stage. So where do we, we usually operate on, well, we see something that is not, and but also we can see the good like that. And that keeps nice relationships. And that helps to bring about one well, Krishna's mercy. Then we can work together. So this forest fire is quite insidious and it can destroy. Prabhupada said this movement cannot be destroyed from the outside. It's not possible. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is conducting this movement. And it's by his mercy that is coming through the great acharyas that they're spreading Krishna consciousness everywhere. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wants to fulfill his own statement, which was prophetic, 
that in every town and village my name will be chanted. I just think of this movie, and it's going to every town and village. Now, of course, we're doing, Lord Chaitanya is going every town and village. Our books are going to every town and village. Now, and so many other things. This movement in many places is spreading fast. In other places, places it's not moving at all. It's interesting, we have an, a, a pretty dich big dichotomy in our movement. In some places, it's like, doesn't even get off the ground. <laughs> Lodis are just struggling to keep the, the temple or their day-to-day -day work going on. In other places, as books are going out, people are coming in, more and more preaching is going on, and more and more publications are being made, and it's quite dynamic in many places, especially in India. Our movement's really, I mean, the leaders in India, many of the leaders are embracing this movement now. And temples are opening, devotees are being made, projects are expanding. And this Mayapur TOVP is a powerful, what we say, program to really bring Lord Chaitanya's teachings to the world. So much is going on, and in other places, it's like uh, I can't even get up in the morning to chant my rounds. You know, <laughs> so yeah, this, this is so. But Lord Lord Chaitanya wants this movement every town and village, so it will happen. There's no question about that. But it's a question of who will get the credit. And Krishna told Arjun, if you don't fight. Uh, as far as my will is concerned, it's still going to be carried out. All these persons on this battlefield will be destroyed. That is my will. <laughs> but you being, you are Savasachin, you can be my instrument to carry out. And because you're my devotee, I've chosen you. And because of you're my great devotee, I've chosen you as my instrument to carry out my will to bring saintly rule to the world. But if you don't do it, it'll get done anyway. <laughs> so in the same way, Lord Chaitanya's movement will spread everywhere, but it's up to us to get the credit. Or if we don't get the credit, somebody will get the credit. Some devotees will get the credit. So it's for our benefit, and that way we can purify ourselves. And this is a major, this, we're in a very historical time it's really powerful what's going on really now. The world's on fire. <laughs> it's really on fire. I mean, the political situation, the economic situation is really bad. Wars, economic uh, hatred, it's, it's spreading everywhere. But at the same time, this movement is also... And Prabhupada said, and Prabhupada's never wrong, it's just his prophecies and whatever he said is, is a time thing. It comes in time. And Prabhupada said something really, I guess, it has the power of prophecy, but it's revolutionary. And what did he say? He said, this movement will save the world in its darkest hour. This movement will save them. So we have a great mission. <laughs> what is our mission to purify ourselves and be an instrument for Lord Chaitanya's mercy to, for others? Those two things. It's not enough to just be concerned about our own spiritual advancement. Because actually our own spiritual advancement it hinges on or is based on our own efforts to give Krishna consciousness to others. It's connected. So as we make advancement and we get inspired and to somehow or other take part in spreading, giving Krishna consciousness to others. And as Lord Chaitanya used to say, he told the Korma Brahma, when Korma Brahman wanted to come with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and leave his family, and he was so attached to Mahaprabhu, he said, I just want to leave my family, I want to go with you, I want to be, I just can't give up your association. He, Lord Chaitanya said, no, you have your family, your responsibility, go back. He said, 
you can have my association and you'll always be with me if you if you do two things he said whoever you meet tell them about krishna whoever you meet tell them about chanting the hari krishna maha mantra he said by my command be guru save the land he was talking to a householder who had responsibilities and and then he said if when you do that, you will never be separated from me. So this was not just for that Korma Brahman, it was for everyone. <laughs> it was for everyone. That the association of the Lord is available when we take the mission of the Lord as our focus in life. And Krishna is there, Mahaprabhu is there. I was feeling that. Sri Hanuman, where are you going? Huh? Okay. See you later. Okay. Yeah. I was feeling that in last night's kirtan. The presence of Mahaprabhu was so strong last night. It was amazing. I, you know, we were a ragtag bunch last night. I mean, we were... <laughs> We weren't like so instrumentally, you know, expert. We were lacking excellence of elements. <laughs> I mean, the kirtan wasn't melodious. <laughs> we were banging on the drums like we were packing cardboard boxes or something. <laughs> and it was just like, you know, but somehow it was going on. <laughs> And I, I and I could I was just watching the devotees and everybody was smiling and jumping. We have our friend sitting back there. He's smiling now. I, he had a smile for the whole kirtan, and it was like it was encompassing his whole face, going around his, the back of his neck. He was smiling so big. It was huge. And I was just looking at him. I'm thinking. I think I'll smile too. <laughs> it was so powerful. I mean, there was many devotees who were, had that mood, and the ladies too. I once in a while I glanced over there, and they were doing flips in the air, <laughs> almost. <laughs> so the kirtan was. So I was thinking, thank you, Mahaprabhu. He was. Re I could feel his presence in that kirtan. <laughs> Because, you know, our Murdanga players were just looking at me like, how long have we, do we have to continue this? <laughs> they were smiling, but it was kind of a mixed smile. <laughs> it was some other element there. <laughs> but at the end, they were both relieved and elevated. <laughs> So it was a wonderful experience. So that's Mahaprabhu. When we make we make an effort to somehow or other absorb ourselves in Krishna consciousness, the mercy becomes really much of it. It's all about mercy. What is who what are we? What can we do? We can remember a few things and somehow or other try to execute it, but only when the mercy of the Lord flows into the association of devotees does everything become wonderful. So we want that. We want to avoid this forest fire, which is des destroys the, um, the, the it blocks the mercy of the supreme personality of Godhead. So, any questions so far? I could speak more, but I don't want to carry on this class too late, and I want to keep keep within the uh, time frame. Yes, um, Nityananda Brahm, Prabhu. Oh, okay.
Uh huh. Where do you draw the line? No. Yeah. Um, a parent has to see maybe the child is not behaving right or doesn't know what the right thing to do is. So the parent, as a duty and as a service to the child, makes some correction and sometimes even some reprimand. So that's done out of concern for the welfare of the child. Not done because, well, it's simply disturbing me and therefore it should be, you know, it shouldn't happen. Same with a spiritual master, one who's performing properly the mood of a spiritual master. He has to see what are the apparent lackings in his devotees or even some wrong activities and in a, a way that is corrective has to point that out. When it gets severe, sometimes there's some, we get a little, there's a little heavy just to make a point. I mean, Prabhupada did that. There was one devotee, this was quite, this was unique. There was one devotee who was a preacher. This happened in New Vrindavan. This was way back in 1969, I think, in New Vrindavan, or maybe 72, when Prabhupada was there. And Prabhupada was talking philosophically. And this person, who was a preacher, asked a question based on Bhagavad Gita. And Prabhupada said, you don't know that. Why are you asking me this question? You don't know Bhagavad Gita? And you're out there talking to others. Why don't you study Bhagavad Why don't you read Bhagavad Gita? And this person was saying, oh well, yeah, but Prabhupada cut him off. And for 20 minutes, he just blasted him. <laughs> I mean, really blasted him. And uh, I mean, I wasn't there, but I, he I heard from persons who were there, this devotee was devastated. <laughs> he was devastated. Now you might say, well, is Prabhupada being a little bit too much? Prabhupada could see there was something in that person that needed a strong reprimand. So a spiritual master has to be able to both observe and properly guide and correct his disciples. That's his main concern. His philosophy he speaks is secondary. His concern for his disciples is primary. So when Prabhupada was asked, do you know everything? You know, because Prabhupada is so powerful. Prabhupada said, I am not Krishna. <laughs> but I know what I need to know. And what was he saying? I know what it takes to guide my disciples. I know my service to my spiritual master. That I know. And so, yeah. So it's corrective. It's remedial, it's medicinal, and it's beneficial. It's not done in a mean-spirited way or to make that person, what we say, lose their enthusiasm in spiritual life. So that's a sensitive issue in the sense that one has to be able to to see their disciple and somehow make that correction. And also look for faults. But it's the faults that are not based on making oneself feel good because I'm better or just because I'm disturbed with this. It's a fault that needs to be corrected. Like a doctor has to find fault with his patient and search out the disease. The, 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 the person may come because they have a cold, and the doctor says, hmm, I think you have cancer. <laughs> now, the patient may not want to hear that, but the doctor is warning that you know, actually it's worse than you think it is. So is he being critical? No. 
he's being helpful to understand that something else is there that needs to be att attended to. So that's there, yeah. But we find, and this is my own experience, disciples don't want that sometimes. They don't want that. And so how to do that in such a way that you don't burn out your disciples? Because sometimes they become, what we say, unhappy and become less enthusiastic. So that's tough. <laughs> that's tough. But it has to be done. <laughs> it has to be done. <laughs> Does that help? Yeah. Anything else? Any uh, yes, Prabhu? <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you very much for answering many of our questions. Hare Krishna. Actually, uh, I had a one like realization from yesterday's Kirtan, which I wanted to ask. Like yesterday's Kirtan was so good. Like it was one of my good memories in Krishna consciousness. But you, you were also smiling a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it was because of your enthusiasm, Maharaj. I was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I hope nobody recorded that. <laughs> I was thinking, where's Sue Ball? We really wanted to, we were, I was thinking, why isn't he here? <laughs> Don't go away anymore, for, especially when we have kirtans. <laughs> He's also crazy like me. <laughs> Maybe even more so. <laughs> In a nice way. <laughs> yes. So, so Maharaj, like, like in our Krishna consciousness, or there are few such movements, Maharaj. But like, not every time we have like this. So, you were talking about consistency. Like, how do we carry on this? Like, um, does can these experiences define us in the most difficult times? And how can we carry on this? Like very consistently, like it do, does not happen always. Like I feel. Like How to remain strange. enthusiastic in devotional service? That's the question. How to always be enthusiastic? Yeah. 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 Rupa Goswami gives the the philosophical statement. He says, "Endeavor with intelligence." So in any situation, you have to apply your intelligence how best to serve in that situation. Like. Some of you are sleeping right now. That is not using intelligence. Because <laughs> you, it means you just zoned out. So if you're sitting in class, what is your intelligence? Is to try to keep yourself very attentive to what is being said. That's service. At that point, you're serving. You're serving in the best possible way, to hear attentively and to also think about what is being said. And if there's some reason, maybe ask questions based on what you hear. So that's the best way to serve in a hearing position. So in, a, in the best way to serve in any situation becomes our focus. How can I serve in the best possible way? That is enthusiasm. That is enthusiasm. So we think, how can I serve in the best possible way in whatever situation we're in? Even in ordinary relationships, how to relate to devotees and how to keep Krishna consciousness, keep Krishna in the center of everything we do. So then that's enthusiasm. When you're using your intelligence to to execute your devotional service. Sometimes we become mindless and we just get dragged, by, dragged away by just the way we do things. We're like, Prabhupada says we are creatures of habit. And sometimes our habit is not up to the standard. So we have to adjust our habits and our activities in such a way that we're using our intelligence to apply it in each and every situation. <laughs> and when you keep your intelligence active, then Krishna works through that intelligence to inspire you in different ways. He guides you. He shows you. Like that. 
<coughs> just like, I don't want to sound critical, but when you listen to a class and you're actually listening, two things you get out of the class. Two, two results there. One, you get realizations on what's being said or you have questions. If you don't have any of these two, that means you didn't listen. <laughs> realizations on what's being said, something being said starts to make sense or reminds you or something and inspires you. And the other one is questions. And this is from Padma Purana. Padma Purana says that attentive hearing is four things. What is attentive hearing? Faith in the speaker, humility, humility means to absorb, destroying the faults of the mind, that means wherever the mind goes, you bring it back to the sound that's being spoken. And the last one is the results, either realizations or questions. You may not have questions, but you should have got some realization out of what's being said. Like that, somewhere. Like that. So that's that is the highest way you can serve in the hearing process. <laughs> that's perfect, according to Padma Puran. Like that. And the story that illustrates that is from Bhagavat Mahatmya. I don't remember that ghost. What was his name? Gokarna. Gokarna was the Donna Kelly. Do you know that particular pastime? Gokarna was his name, and what was the gay name of the, the that ghost? Remember, he wanted to get out of the ghostly body. Dundakari, yeah, Dundakari. Gokarna was this great sadhu who was reciting Bhagavad Saptaha, and he was doing it from a spiritual point of view, not in a materialistic way. And Gokarna somehow received the message that if he wanted to get out of his ghostly body, he should hear from uh, um, Dandakari, well, get out of the ghostly, he should hear from Gokarna every day. So he attended in his ghostly body, and there were many other persons. So, but he was so absorbed in hearing what Gokarna said that when the lecture was over, he was thinking about what was being said until the next lecture. So he never broke consciousness <clears throat> with whatever message was being delivered. And for seven days he was absorbed. At the end he got liberation. Not only did he, he freed himself from his ghostly body, but he actually attained liberation. Whereas the other persons who came, they got some purification, but they didn't get as much as he did because they weren't absorbed and he, he was. So absorption in Krishna consciousness is the platform of, so whatever you do, even if you're cooking, you're cleaning, you're managing, you're, whatever you're doing, put all your faculties into it, and then that because that's actually the satisfaction that one gets from. But the tendency is in the conditioned soul is I like certain things, and I don't like other things, but I have to do other things. And so we don't get that same type of absorption. But then because it's bhakti and because it's service to the Lord, it becomes nice, even in the smallest little services, no matter what it is. He may be cleaning, you know, the table <laughs> or sweeping up after someone. It could be anything, but because it's devotional service, it, it, it brings the consciousness in to Krishna or to the spiritual master. And then you can relish everything about devotional service. It becomes, what we say, exciting. <laughs> mm, I think there was a book, maybe Prithu Shravana remembers this, Baba Ram Das, Be Here Now, back in the 19, what? 60s or maybe even earlier he wrote this book be here now so that's our philosophy <laughs> be in the moment and what is bhakti vinotakor forget the past that sleeps near the future dream it all 
act in times that are with thee in progress ye shall call. He makes it a poetic expression. The past is gone, you can learn from the past. The future is, you can plan for the future, you can learn from the past, but you have to act in the present. <laughs> That's the only time. There's no other time but now. <laughs> it's always now, right? right? It's never tomorrow or yesterday, it's always now. <laughs> so learning to live in the presence means being Krishna conscious. <laughs> So that's that's the answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Subal Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. <clears throat> In the example of the forest fire that um, Srila Bhaktivedanta Kur equates to arguments and conflict among Vaishnavas. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Krishna comes to extinguish that fire. Uh, the image that we, that at least I get, is that there is, you know, in argument, at least there is two. There's more than one. Mm -hmm. At least two. And um, when Krishna extinguishes that fire, is it that extinguishes the fire for everybody or extinguishes the fire for individuals? And it is so for individuals, there is still, uh, the conflict may be still there. And the pain not necessarily subside just to see mm -hmm. burning happen and people getting burned, you know? How, yeah. how exactly Krishna takes care of that uh, fire uh, well, for the devotees. One has to see what it is needed to somehow or other. You may not agree ever, <laughs> but at the same time, you, you should never keep enmity or envy or hatred towards another person. And Prabhupada says, wherever there's two persons, there's two opinions. <laughs> Even in husband and wife, <clears throat> it's like that. But that doesn't mean there's any enmity or envy there. We agree, but still the, the, the love should be there, or at least the friendship should be there. But I may disagree with you, but I don't. If you bring hatred in, then we're bringing in, you know, that, the wrong mentality or a bad mentality. So we can disagree. I mean, it's just people disagree all the time, even in Krishna consciousness. In fact, we're expert at that. <laughs> I mean, and sometimes due to circumstances, a, a, a forest fire will arise. Nobody wants it, and there's no previous enmity or even any discord before then, but a circumstance will bring something to happen like that. And I'll give you an example. <clears throat> um, Prabhupada was there in one temple, and a very important guest came. Prabhupada wanted to give the guest some prasadam, <clears throat> so he turned to the devotee who was with him <clears throat> and said, "Go get him some mahaprasad." So he went to the pujari room. And the pujari said, well, actually, there's no maha right now. We just put the, uh, the offering is just went on to the altar. And you have to wait till the offering is over, which usually takes 10 to 15 minutes. So the man came back and said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, and there's no maha, that the offering just went on. And Prabhupada said, go and get it now. <laughs> so... At that time, he re-entered the Pujari room, and the devotee was chanting his Gayatri after the offering. So he walked right past the devotee, one on the altar, got picked up the plate, and started to walk off. Now, you can imagine what the Pujari was thinking. <laughs> Probably was the fastest Gayatri he ever did. <laughs> Might even have missed a few words. <laughs> and... Uh, 
So he follows this person who is coming, he's grabbing the offering, and they both arrived at Prabhupada at the same time. So the Pajari is besides himself, and the other devotees just following what Prabhupada said. So now, is this Pajari wrong? No. Is the other person wrong? No. Circumstance. Circumstance sometimes causes some misunderstanding or some dissension. And that happens. It just happens sometimes, just because of circumstances. You know, sometimes we agree, disagree on how best to do the service. And sometimes that disagreement can escalate where one person becomes unhappy or goes away. But it shouldn't cause enmity, envy, or hatred. Or... So, yeah. And so if that's there, that has to, that has to be corrected. So when sometimes a devotee says, my Prabhu, I'm sorry, you know, I argued, and you know, please forgive me, and, and we go on like that. But in other cases, it could be worse. <laughs> when, and Prabhupada makes this point, and this is the end, this is the main point. He says, in devotional service, there is always unity. This is one verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam. He says, when there is apparent disunity, what is that? He says, when devotees lean towards material tendencies, then disunity comes. He says, as you're serving Krishna consciousness, I'm serving, we're united. This is it's Bhagavatam, 4th Canto, 30th chapter, verse number 8 in the purport. It's a landmark purport. It, the, the verses that the Prachetas are being praised by the Supreme Personality of Godhead for their friendship amongst each other. And Vishnu is speaking it. And he says, I'm so pleased with your cooperation and friendliness amongst you. Please take a benediction from me. The Lord is saying how happy he is to see how they're cooperating and friendly. And Prabhupada goes in and says there cannot be disunity in the Krishna conscious movement. But apparently sometimes we lean towards material tendencies and this causes some type of disunity. But if there's disagreement on of harm over service, that is not disunity. That's just different ways that people see how best to serve. But if that breaks into a forest fire and then it becomes a personal thing, and then then we've lost the spirit, you know. Mm -hmm. Your response is completely unresponsive. So give me some feedback. <laughs> you look like like everything I said make, made no sense at all. No, Maharaj, how can you say that? <laughs> Whatever you say always makes sense, Maharaj. No, Thank no you. it's not really. That's, 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 that's no, not. it's, it's it, it, uh, thank you very much. It's, it's, it's an important thing to always remember. And um, um, one thing that I was thinking is that uh, sometimes either you're involved in the situation or you observe the situations happening. As you said, you mentioned in your class that we see this happening now in our movement and we speak, we have experienced it, we see it, you know, like that. And then I wonder, you know, exactly how Krishna comes and extinguishes that. I mean, maybe we don't, I mean, it's more like, anyway, trying to maybe hear some positive, you know, things. Sometimes we get caught in the, in the you down, know, The most you know, important spirit. thing is not to take a personal offenses and to create offenses by this disagreement. 
You can disagree, or you can even... Sometimes we disagree and we go on in our, our own way to do something. I'll give you another example. He was here in Chicago back in the early days when there was a need for a temple president and three devotees wanted it. <laughs> Maybe Sri Shravana Prabhu was here during that time. This was around, I don't know, the early 70s. And uh, Brisha Kapi, Govinda, Govinda Dutt, as his name is? Sri Govinda. Sri Govinda, Grisha Kapi, and one other devotee. They all wanted the temple president position because in those days, hey, if you were temple president, now nobody wants temple president. <laughs> there's a Niskan joke, there's a donkey, he's right, he's walking like this. And someone comes up and says, Mr. Donkey, do you want to be temple president Niskan? <laughs> So, they, I knew you would be pleased with that one. <laughs> so, but in the early days, hey, you could get Prabhupada's association. You, you know, it was like, hey, the VPT people president, we have Prishta Shravana. He was temple president here for years. How many years? Seven, eight years? Five years. In fact, how, you know how I wound up in Chicago? Hi, yeah, and you know how I came to Chicago in 1995? Radhanath Swami said to me, he said, he said, Prithu Shravana needs some help. Go and help him in, in preach in Chicago. And I was in New Vrindavan. He's struggling to keep his, the temple presidency going. And his, I mean, it was difficult in those days, right? It was strange. He was doing an amazing job, and there was a lot of things going on. But Maharaj told me, he said, I, I want you to go up there and do whatever you can to assist Prithu Shravana in preaching and in keeping the temple. So I came because Maharaj asked me. That was in 1995. But back to the story is that when these three devotees wanted that the position of temple president here in Chicago during Prabhupada's time, Sri Govinda got the, got, the, got the position. The other two devotees left the temple and started their own preaching centers. They didn't want to stay anymore, but what they did was they spread Krishna consciousness. <laughs> Prisha Kapi opened a thing in Bloomington, Indiana, and he started a preaching center there. The other person, I'm not sure who it was. I think it was my Nikatma's brother, Vyapati. I'm not sure, that's what I heard. But he also went out and did his own preaching. In other words, the devotees were not willing to stay because they didn't get temple president, but they took that opportunity to open up other places. <laughs> so Krishna consciousness spread because there was some you know, I wanted to be temple president, I could, I'm going to start my own place. <laughs> and Prabhupada liked that, because <laughs> the movement spread. So that's an example how, you know, we can turn apparent something that looks like discord or disagreement into something positive. Prabhupada did that too, when he saw sometimes two very senior devotees having the problems, he took one and put him in another place and gave him another, you know, like, you know, service, and that person excelled. So it's just like that. Sometimes we find ourselves not to be able to work together. Prabhupada said, okay, but still become Krishna conscious. And still... Do something for Krishna. Continue your service. I mean, I'm faced with that situation now where I'm preaching in, in the Balkans. The same situation is there. Devotees can't get along, but what's happening? Other centers are opening up <laughs> because of that. <laughs> it's amazing. You know? They want to start their own thing. Okay, fine. <laughs> but the problem is when there's envy, enmity, or bad talking bad about each other, that ruins everything. 
devotees have to, all right, I don't disagree, I disagree with the situation. Well, we can go on in a, we can go on in a different way. So, but when one is motivated by personal interests, in other words, something material, then that causes some type of disunity. Apparent disunity. <laughs> you see the points? Yeah. So we can agree to we can we can agree to disagree. Yes, Bonnie, you have a question. Hare Krishna Maharaj. <clears throat> go nice and loud. Um. You speak so softly. Not usually. <laughs> but, um, so there is this concept sometimes among people in general, at least in America, that my friend is somebody who I tell secrets to. And so sometimes people will approach you and they're trying to be friendly, but really, you know, they want to gossip or tell you something very negative and sometimes they'll even try to pull you away from the kirtan to do it and i'm wondering what is the nicest way to reject these kind of advances without hurting people's feelings because well, it happens a lot if you're in a kirtan you could say you know hey we're in the kirtan see you later <laughs> and then when you see them later you said oh i just forgot i got an appointment <laughs> But what if you're on like like the Exit front desk? stage left, you know. What if you're stuck in one place, like when you're serving on the front desk? Oh, I have to use the bathroom. Are you all? In other words, find some excuse to get away. <laughs> or if you're able to divert the conversation to something different, something positive. If you can do that, that's the best. But if you can't, just like we glorify one very wonderful devotee in our movement, Jayananda. And he was a hero in many ways, and he was glorified. And one of the qualities he was glorified was if somebody was speaking negative about any devotee and he was present, he'd immediately leave. He never said a word, he'd just go. And then people would say, oh, Jayananda's left. That means we're not talking properly. Because <laughs> everyone knew that he never liked to f hear about or find fault with anybody. That was his, one of his outstanding qualities. So we can practice that in the best possible way. But sometimes when you get a, a friend, somebody who's really friend with you, and then they start doing it, and then becomes a little bit more of a thought process how to quell that. And you don't want to hear that because it's not necessary. And sometimes after you listen to this, you say, why did I listen to that? Now I feel so unhappy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, not sometimes, most of the times, when people speak about other people, it's their own opinion. And they want you to agree with their opinion so, you can, so they can feel good or, or right about their opinion. And it's just their opinion. <coughs> so use some, some tactics to either divert the attention away from the subject or somehow remove yourself from the situation. Gadadhar Pandit, when Vallabhacharya tried to speak Srimad Bhagavatam to Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya didn't want to listen to him. And Vallabhacharya was a great, because Vallabhacharya was proud of his commentary. And Lord Chaitanya could see that pride and therefore he didn't want to kind of like fuel that pride by listening to Vallabhacharya. So he just 
didn't listen. And then when Vallabhacharya went to the other devotees, they understood Mahaprabhu's mood and they didn't listen either. But when he went to Gadadhar Pandit, now Gadadhar Pandit is so gentle, so sweet, so he's just a you know, humility personified. He immediately started repeating fastly his commentary and Gadadhar Pandit, he just, oh no, Mahaprabhu doesn't want us to hear this. But I don't want to offend this great devotee. What do I do? So then in his heart, he started to pray seriously to the Lord. I don't really want to hear him, but I don't want to offend him because he's such a great devotee. So he kind of not listened, but it didn't seem at the same time he didn't leave. And Mahaprabhu later appreciated how Gadadhar Pandit did and dealt with that. But at the same time, Srup Damodar Goswami didn't appreciate it. And he found fault with Gadadhar Pandit. So there was a difference between how Mahaprabhu perceived it and how Srup Damodar Goswami perceived it. But Gadadhar Pandit acted in the best possible way, according to his nature. He wasn't, he couldn't just leave. He felt I was going to offend this great soul. So he didn't. And this was this Bhagavatam. So you see there's a certain situation. Now when it becomes criticism or blasphemy or fault finding, then that's different. Does that help? Uh, yes, it, 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 it's very wonderful advice. Thank you. It's very, it's very good advice. It's just uh, sometimes it's a very pervasive mood and sometimes there's like nowhere to go unless you're trying to leave the event altogether. Yeah. Certain personalities will chase you down when they want to tell you something, you know, very much, especially on the East Coast. I think you can deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you're used to these things, right? <laughs> I used to think I could deal with it, but I, I, I realized that I'm not very humble. Not, and I used to think I was, you know, and then I realized I'm not. You can say, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we don't want to take up much too much time. So we had this, this a disciples meeting at 11.15. Uh, so all the disciples, aspiring disciples, who should come for this. It's Nista Ghosti, and there's questions and answers. And that'll be up in, uh, you know, the sannyas room. So everyone can come at 11.15. Anyone else who wants to come can also come. But it's geared towards disciples and aspiring disciples. But everyone's, everyone's welcome to come if you want. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. His Holiness Chandra Moli Maharaj Ki Jai. Hare Krishna, dear devotees. So, we have Prashant being served upstairs. We also humbly request whoever feels inspired. Right now, downstairs, there is vegetable caught up that is happening for the Sunday feast. So at least we request the temple devotees to go and help with that. And if some of the guests would like, you know, um, uh, you can come, but also make sure that you have plenty of time to take prasadam and to be on time for His Holiness Chandra Moli Maharaj Istagosti. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Oh, I just been informed that the vegetable court is done. The efficient devotees have done it. Thank you. Haribo. So, Prashanam upstairs. Hare Krishna. <laughs>